and uh, for most of you it's like a an emergency problem so um, I'm just going to go uh, through the um, stages now so um, when we talk about um, occlusion what we really want you to do is imagine that you know your patients are stable we want to achieve stability with them so they're not coming in with problems uh, on a regular basis especially after you know complex uh, work that you've done um, so this is the ideal dream that we, we have patients that are always stable but this isn't always achievable uh, and I'll explain why over the over the, the small talk uh, this is a little bit about myself just very quickly so 20 years qualified uh, I recently finished a, a master's in soft tissue with uh, Professor Zucchelli in Bologna that was a uh, very very interesting and very uh, uh, rewarding. Um, so these are the scenarios that we are going to be discussing today. Uh, so I'm going to deal with three scenarios. One is the patient and how this affects occlusion, uh, precluded restoration, so restoration of the proud, uh, and uh, sort of a difficult occlusion scheme where people would think, you know, you need to do complex restorative dentistry, but that isn't always the case. Uh, if we have time, we will talk about, uh, well, we will talk about how to manage these patients, but uh, we, will, we may have the opportunity to sort, talk about digital dentistry and how this is uh, being enhanced, the special inclusion. Um, so the management principles for uh, managing any patient, but also uh, a patient who has some issues. Um, I always think of my patients like a, a puzzle, like a, a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and the more pieces that I have from them, uh, the better the picture that I can develop and therefore a diagnosis and then a treatment plan. So we need a detailed history. Uh, we need a thorough examination uh, and an appropriate diagnosis. Once we have these issues, then we can have a, a treatment plan. And I think about my treatment plan like uh, a destination, you know, going from home to London or, you know, from wherever you are, going to Cairo or going to uh, another city. At least if you know that city and the destination, then you can plan your journey. Uh, and then we have to maintain these patients uh, as well. So I'm going to show you a little video uh, of a patient that, uh, that I did some complex work on about three years ago. But it took me five, two years to treat the patient. Wow. Two years. Several weeks yes. ago. And it started by waking up one morning and having really strong pain in both jaws. And it didn't disappear. I took a lot of tablets for it, mm -hmm. lots of ibuprofen, mm -hmm. naproxen. Didn't really make any difference. Strong stop. Yeah. Make me feel. It made me feel really down and depressed because it was impossible to eat without it hurting for ages after. So consequently, you eat less. Yeah. Which is not. You, you lose a... weight, which is something well, I suppose. But you know, yeah, uh, it's, you it's can't really you can't enjoy any food. So this uh, uh, lovely lady who you know I treated. Three years ago, I completed the treatment three years ago, but it took me two years to, to complete the treatment. Uh, she woke up uh, about three months ago. She woke up with strong pain in both her jaws. She was taking some painkillers, which didn't help. So this was the joint and the muscle problems, but there was also a psychological, so there was a brain impact here, and she was starting to feel down and, and depressed by it. Uh, so a summary of that was what she presented with. And this was the case. So, you know, this was the start, you know, five years ago, this is what she presented with. Uh, and then we restored her, took me two years with crown, you know, with soft wow. tissue work. And wow. so, so we got her to this place, but this is all about occlusion. And so these were the occlusal contacts at the time that we, we finished. So we had some stable occlusal contacts on all the teeth, except the ticks. So except the pontics, we had it. And on the, di on the dynamic occlusion, on her chewing occlusion, she had group function, which is, which is generally the occlusal scheme I, I like to give my patients. Uh, so this is what she started with. Uh, so then three years later, she then presents again. So these are now three-year photos. So I've got the starting position. Now this is at three years. Uh, and the occlusion has changed. Now she has no more occlusion on the posterior teeth. Her occlusion is slightly more heavy on the anterior teeth. Uh, and when we look at dynamic, 
she is now guiding on the pontics and not on the, the teeth that I had designed the occlusion on three years ago. So why did this why did this change you know over the over the over the time? So the reason why it changed is because you have to remember that TMJ, the joint, is linked to teeth and it's linked to the muscles and it's also linked to the brain. So you know, three years ago she was fit and well. In the last couple of months, something has changed, and we need to know why something has changed. Because if you change, you know, I know the teeth are stable, the teeth have not moved, but maybe the muscles have tightened, the joint has become inflamed, and so then they will move, and therefore your occlusion will also change. And so we have to go back to the basics of occlusion to understand uh, how the system works. Uh, and this is a very good article by Stuart in. Um, the Neuroscience Journal in 2018, looking at something called central pattern generators. So if you look at the, uh, the picture here, the teeth touch um, either through chewing, either through swallowing, but the teeth touch. And when they touch, that sends an impulse uh, via the ascending pathways into the, uh, into the brain. Now, it, the prime replaces the brainstem, and it's normally, the brainstem itself is split into three parts. It's the, uh, the pons, the medulla, medulla uh, and the mesencephalic area. And so the chewing center and the swallowing center are in the pons uh, and the medulla part of it. So this creates a pattern. It's how you know not to chew soup, for example, how you know how to chew uh, you know, soft food, you know how to not apply a lot of force on because of your memory, it creates a pattern. This information is sent to the muscles. So when you have food that is really tough, you know that you need to apply more force. So this information is sent to the muscles so you can apply the more force. But sometimes you bite on a stone and you suddenly open quickly. This is called a, a reflex arc. Through this, it also goes to, uh, sorry, I was a bit too clear. It goes to the brain, uh, the higher order part of the brain, which is the cerebral cortex. Um, in the area, it is called feedback and feedback learning. This is how we learn our food. Now, when it comes to TMJ, we want to think about it, you know, in, 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 in essence, why is it unique? Well, the TMJ is really only unique in, in several ways. One is in movement, in translation and rotation. So it has two movements. It also has two joints joined by one bone. So if you do a crown on the right side, you can also upset the left as well. So this is why it's important that we get occlusion right. But when it comes to inflammation, meaning when you traumatize your elbow, your knee, your ankle, it becomes inflamed through the trauma. The TMJ joint is also the same that way. If you traumatize it through overusing it, through a fall, through getting punched, or through grinding your teeth, or having a lot of chewing gum, or biting your nails, it will become inflamed. Uh, and so this is the system that we know very well. The teeth, the TMJ muscles, and then the periodontum supporting structures. But the, the teeth have five main jobs, as does the joints and the muscles. And the five main jobs are chewing, swallowing, and speech. They are three, what we call physiological jobs. Uh, and then you have two that are pathological, parafunction and hypernormal function. Uh, and when we come to assess occlusion, there's a reason why we want you to assess it in several ways. We want you to check it when you're asking the patient to chew, move their jaw left and right. Why? Because these are your chewing contacts. When you ask them to tap their teeth together, this is because this is the swallowing contacts. And then phonetics is a freedom issue. Um, and then parafunction can either be clenching, which is when the teeth are static, they do not move. And then people can also grind their teeth by moving the jaw, and we call this bruxism. system is then not healthy how can we treat the teeth and so what's really important is that when we before we go down doing full mouth we have restoratives we need to make sure that we check that the, the system is healthy uh, and the way the system works is like a class three lever, lever system um, and this is like a nutcracker 
So when you put a nut in the nutcracker, you always put it right at the fulcrum, right at the joint. And the reason for that is because you then put very little effort, but you have a lot of force uh, as well. And that's why when you chew, you put the food right at the back because of the force. So what can change? So this lady, you know, three years ago, she had a healthy system and she had healthy teeth. Uh, so what changed? Well, you have to always remember that attached to this system is the human brain. And we call this adaptation. Uh, so a human adaptation can change with time. And the things that can cause us to change over time is stress. It can be illness. It certainly can be age if we get older. And then you will have people who will have a variation between themselves because of their genetic code. So understanding that means that we need to have a diagnosis for these patients. Uh, and most diagnose, diagnostic systems and classification systems, they are all created uh, based on one main principle. Uh, they are always based on anatomy as the primary principle. So when we look at TMD, all these diagnoses that come for TMD are all based on the anatomy of that joint. So when we look at the, the diagnosis retrodiscitis and cassipulitis, retrodiscitis is dealing with the retrodiscal tissues, cassipulitis is dealing with the capsule, myofascial pain is dealing with the muscles and the ligaments, disc displacement is dealing with the cartilage, and the osteoarthritis is dealing with the bone. And that's how simple TMD is. It's all based on anatomy. So when we come to assess these patients, we need to make sure that we have done a history, we've done a thorough joint examination, a thorough movement assessment, a thorough sound assessment, and a thorough muscle examination. If we get all the jigsaw pieces together, then we have a diagnosis, which is on the right, and therefore we can manage these patients. But sometimes we have all the jigsaw pieces and we still don't have a diagnosis. So it means that we need to do more investigation. So normally within TMJ or TMD issues, we look for an MRI scan as our preferred further analysis. There's also sleep tests that we need to do sometimes and also uh, anxiety and depression tests as well. So these all come under special investigations. So normally the questions we like to ask patients who have uh, TMD issues is we need to first understand that what is causing the problem at the start. Now most inflammation is always caused by trauma uh, and within the TMJ the first major trauma that a patient can get will be either through an accident, a fall, um, it can also be due to hobbies like um, football, rugby, martial arts, uh, boxing can cause major trauma to the joint. But within the TMD, we also have minor or micro trauma, of which parafunction and hypernormal function are the two main groups. Parafunction is your grinding and your clenching. Hypernormal function is your habits, such as biting the nails, having a lot of chewing gum. So if, they, if, if a patient has inflammation of these joints, we always need to look at what trauma is causing the inflammation. So when it comes to taking a history, for a patient with TMD. These are the three main components of that history. We need to ask questions on the history of the pain. We also need to ask questions on the history of the noises coming from the joint, and then also how they, how they move. Uh, I know at some point I'll be doing a TMD sort of uh, discussion, so I won't go into too much detail, but that's the general overview of our history taking. When it comes to examination, we like to do a joint exam, a movement analysis, sound analysis, and a muscle examination. Uh, and we look at this picture done by Marcel Lagal and Roger Yerga. The muscles are obviously key in when it comes to the function of the, uh, of the joints. So what I've done is I've created a little TMD flowchart for you for diagnosis and management. So you'll see on the left side of your screen, history examination. 
we get some jigsaw pieces from a joint exam, movement assessment, sound, muscles, and sleep test. And then from that, we have a diagnosis. And if we have a diagnosis, then we have a management plan for them. What I've created here as well is something called the progressive journey for patients. Most of us will start if we have minor trauma, meaning we're grinding our teeth or uh, having lots of habits. The first thing that happens is the muscles become inflamed. If the muscles become inflamed, then the cartilage becomes displaced. Uh, and if that cartilage becomes displaced, it normally will reduce back. But if it doesn't reduce back, it then becomes stuck. And then we start to have limited mouth opening. And then if there's no more cartilage between your bones, you start to get arthritis. Now, this is a lifetime progression. But then you have patients on the right who get major trauma and they can sometimes jump from having no myofascial pain, but simply to arthritis, for example, boxers or people who keep getting uh, uh, major trauma to the joints. So treatment for these patients always is counseling. We try to tell them what the problem is. What we recommend is heat treatment, which is uh, a hot flannel against the joints and the muscles for five minutes, three times a day for six weeks. We ask them to be careful with their diet. Uh, physiotherapy is very effective uh, and some non-steroidal or muscle relax relaxants like diazepam, five, five or 10 milligrams for a week can help. And then there are some splints that can help as well. Uh, Botox has shown some uh, efficacy uh, as well. Uh, we certainly offer it uh, as a treatment modality at the TMD clinic in Manchester, but it's given by the MaxFax uh, surgeon. Uh, and there are some protocols to it, which I won't go into right now. But I want to just share a little bit about stabilization splint and what it can do, because for me, it is an important tool to have as a prosthodontist. What it's designed to do is stabilize the and really in reality reduce the muscle tension and the muscle activity. And if it does that, then the muscle become healthier or less strained. Uh, and therefore the joint position becomes more stable. And this is, this is the splint that I made uh, this patient. So her diagnosis when she came to see me was myofascial pain. And because she'd had complex dentistry, I made her a splint. And you, the circles where the blue dots are all static, her swallowing contacts, and the red marks are her dynamic contacts. So we've given her canine guidance and protrusive guidance without any interferences. So you can see that from, from, from this slide. So this is what, this was her occlusion then, uh, after we had uh, seen her after three years and we'd see that it had changed uh, and all the guidance had changed. So after I'd done a splint, this is her, her new occlusion. So after I'd got her muscles nice and healthy and relaxed, I then adjusted the occlusion again because it, it had changed these now unstable static contacts again and also now I've given back the dynamic contacts as before I like group function as my preferred occlusal scheme but this is what the patient felt after we gave her the splint well, the splint was a nice thought there at night because it felt okay I was surprised I was thinking it would be impossible to sleep with the splint in but it was I'm sleeping. And since I've worn the suit, it's just still improved. It's taken a few weeks, but it's definitely improved, and now it feels it's great. And each time we've done the adjustment, have things got better? Yes, so absolutely. So they're, they're only small adjustments, but they seem to make a big difference. So each time I've come through, it's just been better. And if, we, if 10 was the worst it's felt, what score are we now? Oh, 10 was the best. That's, no, 10 was the worst pain. 10 was the worst ten pain. Ten. Now it's nothing. It's gone. Wow. It's gone. So what we did there was with her, we put a splint in, we relaxed her muscles and all her symptoms um, settled. Okay, so this is scenario two. Uh, and we're dealing with a super occluded uh, restoration. So this lady had had three crowns done, uh, three implant crowns done and fitted. Uh, and 
she presented with TMJ oh, and acute symptoms as well from, from that. So she presented after having the three, crown, uh, three crowns fitted. Uh, she, she, uh, she had some pain and numbness on the right side. She was diagnosed with sinusitis. They gave her steroids and antibiotics and none of this, none of this worked. Um, but the history was really important. All her symptoms started as soon as the crowns were fitted. So the third scenario that I'll deal with as well, so I'm gonna go through these last two scenarios. This is a patient who has uh, some incisal wear, so mainly his lateral incisors that he's concerned with, and that is his occlusal uh, scheme when he bites in, a, in centric occlusion. Uh, and he is not complaining about anything else. He's a 55 years old, so he's not a young gentleman. <laughs> but he's just now conscious that his front teeth are not looking as, uh, as they did before. So he's wanting a restorative solution for his incisal chipping, and that's his complaining. Okay, no real functional issue, but he is now avoiding using his front teeth, so he's being a bit more careful with it. So let's look at these two scenarios. How, why did the first scenario occur where the occlusion was proud, and how do we restore uh, a simple, in can I, simple. Well, can I just interrupt you for just one minute? Because of course, of course. Uh, I, I just have to explain what proud is. Proud means uh, it's it's um, it's in super occlusion, uh, because yeah. this is this is an English word. <laughs> so the proud, Egyptian, yes. our Egyptian colleagues uh, may may think proud means proud. You know what I mean? Yes, we, okay, use the, we use yeah we use this uh, we use this word um, uh, this term very um, um, very commonly here in the UK and uh, um, um, high spot means um, high spot. somebody complains Super that that, that background feels a bit proud or this this feeling feels a bit proud meaning it is high yeah. I just yes. I needed to intervene here because we we're using English terms so the Egyptians have to understand what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. no, 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 my pleasure. Thank continue, you. Continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So you've got scenario one, two, uh, and three. So the question that I asked myself was, why did scenario two occur? Why did the restorations, when they were fitted, why did they have high spots uh, on them? And uh, how would you know that when you do the scenario three? where you restore these teeth that you don't change the occlusion before you treat it because this is the issue uh, that we have what what i want to try and teach you or share with you um, certainly today is a way of making sure that you assess the occlusion before you even start restoring the teeth because if you haven't assessed the occlusion beforehand you don't know if you've done it you don't know if you've conformed afterwards uh, and that's the key. The key is making sure that we can conform. Uh, and if we are conforming and we've made the decision to conform, then you need to know what you're conforming uh, to. But there needs to be some criteria that have to be met to make sure that we know this is a this is an occlusion that we want to keep. We don't want to change. So when they bite together, they need to be biting together in a reproducible position. It must be stable, meaning that there has to be enough teeth there and the occlusal vertical dimension or the VDO, OVD or VDO, is, this, is, is correct for that patient. Now, if they have lost a lot of teeth and the OVD is, all, is reduced, so the occlusion is not stable, then we think about reorganizing the occlusion. But most of your patients will be patients that don't need reorganizing. They just need conforming to what they have when they are presented to you. So what we want to make sure is that you do not reorganize their occlusion by accident. Mm -hmm. How do we make you predictable? So if you are going to conform, the reason why we do it is because it is safe for the patient, it is safe for you, it is easier. It means that the restorations, if we conform properly, is predictable and they last. They're not coming out, they're not breaking, also, the teeth are not moving because you're keeping them in the right place and the patient will not come back in pain. So we need to make sure we can examine uh, this system. So there's a few things that I want to just clear up before we, we go into occlusion a bit more. Is something about terminology as well. 
we'll talk a little bit about history and how to assess a patient with occlusion. Uh, we will then touch on examination and occlusion, occlusal contacts, what equipment you need, and what uh, occlusal contacts we are looking at. So, examination. First, you have to understand occlusal contacts. So there's a question I always ask all my uh, students or, or, or my delegates on the course is, you know, which tooth in a class one occlusion, so class one incisor relationship, class one canine relationship and a class one molar relationship, if the buccal cusp of the lower second premolar touches the opposing tooth, where would you get a mark? And this is something you would, you know, think through because if you can understand this, you can understand occlusion. Same as, for example, the mesioglacial cusp of the first molar, the upper first molar, that would touch were in the in the in the lower uh, tooth. Uh, so the answer for the buccal cusp is that it would touch on the mesial marginal ridge of the upper five and the distal marginal ridge of the upper four. And this is a uh, an indirect restoration that I have fitted on this patient. So I have a pre-assessment and then a post-assessment so I know that I'm conforming uh, predictably in my restorations. If you look at this on a digital scan as well, you can see that the mesioplatal cusp of the upper sits in the fossa of the lower. So these are the answer to those two questions. If you know this, then it makes occlusion a lot easier. Uh, what people have discussed in the past is something called tripod contacts, meaning that each cusp to fossa relationship is a three-point contact and a cusp to marginal ridge is a two-point contact. Uh, and this is the upper and lower occlusal scheme for that. But um, we don't really see three-point contacts in nature. This is more of a uh, prostodontic issue because we want to make sure that our restoration are being designed with compressive forces, not tensile forces. Why do we not see three-point contacts in nature? Because our occlusion would be then fixed, it would not move, it would be a locked-in occlusion. Uh, also, what happens with time is teeth were, and there's a teeth movement, you know, you take out a tooth, even with just physiological mesial drift, our occlusion will be changing over time. And also the reality is a lot of the restorations placed today don't really conform to the, the actual physiological shape of the tooth. And then we take teeth out and teeth move. So this is the reason why occlusion will change through the patient's life. What, as a minimum, I like to teach is a point contact. So at least you have a point contact from each supporting cusp into either fossa or marginal ridge. So you can see here, on the lower part of your screen, the buccal cusp of the four would sit in the opposing arch on the me uh, mesial marginal ridge of the four and the distal ridge of the three. Uh, and then you move across uh, along and, and the red dots correspond to the uh, opposing arch. And then it comes to equipment. Uh, and this, I always say to my uh, students as well, is that you know, if you went to a, a, a mechanic to fix your car, and he did not have that many tools. You know, he, he was doing, he was trying to fix your car with only maybe one spanner, one wrench, a hammer. You know, would you leave your car to be fixed if you don't have, if you know that he does not have all the equipment? Uh, and dentists are the same. If we don't have the equipment, then how can we do uh, the best job we can? Uh, if you look at the bottom right picture here, you'll see that there are three Miller forceps. These are uh, metal forceps that hold articulating paper and there's three there one is blue one is red and one is white and the white is tissue uh, and the most important one is the white one because when you ask them to bite uh, against the tissue it will dry uh, the teeth when you can dry the teeth then you will get a better color transfer but we have some challenges with uh, articulating paper you first have to understand morphology of teeth but once you understand morphology of teeth, then you know what is the difference between a contact and a smear. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but you also have a challenge of forces. So when the patient bites the teeth together, they may bite hard, they may bite soft. So you will get different color transfer. And then you also need to know how to remove or which one to remove 
when it comes to the coloring contacts. Uh, so we dry the teeth, step one, very important. And then we ask the patient to tap the teeth together. Now, this is 200 micron thick paper. And you can see that we have a lot of color transfer on the teeth. Some would say this is very good. And we will, ask, we will answer the question why we don't want it uh, in a minute. This is 100 microns. So you see, again, a lot of color transfer. If you look at the lower right, seven, you have a distal buccal, mesial buccal contact and a small fossa contact. And on the crown, on the six, you have a distal buccal, distal lingual. On the five, you have a marginal ridge buccal cusp contact. And on the four, you have a buccal cusp contact. This is 40 microns. So you see here again, similar contacts to the three previous pictures. And then we have 20 microns here. Uh, so which one would we prefer? Well, the way to try and help you understand this would be that if I was doing a filling on this lower right five, so this is a DO composite, and this is you know routine dentistry for all of you. Uh, and I, I had a proud contact here. So so now I've done the composite and I bet the patient to bite together. And I'm using 20 microns and they bite and it is proud. This is where the contact would be shown. And if I had to then adjust, I'm only taking away a very small amount of material. So it means that I'm being very precise, but also being very conservative. I'm preserving or saving more tooth or filling. Therefore, it means that there's less chance that I will be infra-occluded. But if I was doing it on using 200 microns, so this is the same size restoration that I did on the previous slide, and it is proud, but I'm using 200 microns, can you see how much tooth or, or composite restoration you would have to take away? Therefore, your restoration would become infra-occluded, and it would then change the way the teeth meet over time. Shimstock foil is very accurate. This is eight microns, and we use this when we want to be as precise as possible. So when we come to assess the occlusion, we look at the occlusion in several ways. First, we want to check swallowing occlusion, and we want to check chewing occlusion. And then in these movements, we want to make sure there are no teeth that are interfering with our swallowing or our chewing occlusion, and we call these working side, non-working side contacts. So if we look at static occlusion, as part of my assessment, I always do a skeletal relationship assessment, an incisal, canine and molar relationship, OVD measurement, overjet and overbite measurement. And these are my records at the start so that I know that if I want to change or I want to stay the same, my measurements shouldn't change if I uh, are keeping the occlusion the same. But if I want to increase the OVD, then I know that I need to measure and how much I'm going to increase, I can then check as well. So this is a really important measurement. Skeletal relationship, class one, class two and class three. Sorry, I was a bit too quick there. Uh, so this is a skeletal relationship and it's an orthodontic assessment. In size of relationship, we have a class one, class two and class three. And these are dictated by the incisor contact. So the low incisor touches the singulum plateau of the upper. That is a class one incisor relationship. If we look at it from a picture point of view, you'll see the left to the right. It is all about the contact of the low incisor ledge against the palatal aspect of the upper. And that dictates incisor relationship. Molar relationship, very important. You know, class one, class two and class three. There is a reason why I want to know these contacts is because in a class one where the mesial buccal cusp sits in the mesial buccal groove of the lower molar, this will mean that when I come to assess occlusion, the contacts will be, for example, the mesial palatal cusp of the upper will sit in the fossa of the lower. But if it's a class two, it will move. That it means the mesial palatal cusp will sit in the marge maybe of the lower. So already in my mind, thinking that the occlusion is different in different molar relationships. So this is a uh, your classic class one molar relationship. Uh, and again, looking at from the Plato aspect. Uh, you get two half unit molar relationship, how it is moved. 
the mandible has moved back. So you have different occlusal schemes and therefore the contacts will change. And this is looking at it from a palatal aspect. In the canine relationship, you have the maxillary canine sits in between the embrasure of the mandibular canine and the first premolar, and then everything moves to the class two and the class three. So this is a class two relationship because here the canine is not sitting between the three and four, it is sitting between the three and the two because the double has moved back. So this is a class two canine relationship. Overjet. This is a important measurement and overjet is a vertical, is a, sorry, is a horizontal measurement. And it is from the incisal edge of the lower, of the upper incisor to the uh, facing of the buccal facing of the lower incisor. And we have some measurements. And then overbite is a vertical assessment. And you see here, two to four is a guide as an ideal. And then overbite deep and traumatic and an anterior, an anterior open bite. And these are all our standard measurements that we do. So how do we um, do, a, do an assessment for a restoration, for example, or any assessment? So number one, we dry the teeth always, and we use millers with articulating paper. We ask the patient to bite, tap, 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 and slide their jaw. And then we do our treatment. Once we've done our treatment, we dry the teeth again, and we reassess the occlusion, static and dynamic, and then we adjust. How do we adjust the high spot? Well, if you are using um, 40 micron paper, then you need to use a 40 micron diamond burr. And so, for example, this one is a, a 40 micron diamond burr, and it has a yellow band on it. Uh, and what we mean by micron is the, the, the diamond grit in the burr is 40 microns. So it means that when I put it against the restoration, as long as I'm not pressing too hard, I will be taking away 40 microns each time. So let's go through how we adjust this scenario here. So this is the lady, three crowns, three implant crowns, and I'm sure Sam would agree that these have been placed surgically, been placed very well and the restorations are allowed for the papilla to so the it's quite a result uh, quite challenging as well so these are so this is what she's presented with so when we dry the teeth and she taps together you can see that the only marks are on the three crowns and when she slides, so that was static uh, occlusion. This is now dynamic occlusion. When she slides her jaw, she's only being guided by the implant crown. We do the shim stock assessment. So when you put shim stock foil in between the teeth, she is not biting. So the lower canine and the upper canine are not touching at all. They are out of occlusion. And the molar back teeth are out of occlusion. And when she goes to the left side, this is out of occlusion. So the rest of are proud. So when we come to adjust teeth, we need to make sure that we hold the burr, copying the shape of the teeth. So you see here, my burr is angled, copying the contour of the teeth. I don't hold the diamond burr flat, because I don't want to make the teeth flat. I want to copy the shape of the teeth. So when I reduce the proudness of the restoration we always copy the shape and we reduce the angle of the of the restoration rather than making it flat so when i'm holding the bear like this it is at the angle of the cuspal uh, restoration so i hold it like this like this like this because these are contacts that are on the cusps in the fossa contact we can hold it like that back to holding it on the cusp cusp fossa adjustment so these this restoration is proud and you see here you know five even 30 seconds later now this the canine and the molar are now touching but also the implants are touching as well so we've now given back her contacts on her natural teeth when we do the k the static the dynamic adjustment we adjust the four it now moves onto the premolar and the molar so we adjust this and this and now we have pure guidance of the teeth rather than the implants 
after the adjustment, you can see now that she, the, her natural teeth are holding the shimstock foil on the canine, shimstock foil on the molar, but also on the implants. And why? Because she has a very sensitive occlusion. So we need to make sure we give her an occlusion that is the same as her natural teeth, because she will react if you don't. But importantly, because two joints are joined by one bone, I've done the adjustment on the right side, but I also check the left side as well. And then there's another way that I assess occlusion is by using my pressure, my finger. And so the patient is tapping her teeth and I'm checking that now I have some contacts. So there is some force being transferred to the teeth. And it even sounds better. Okay, so that was scenario two. Uh, the last scenario, how do we uh, restore this patient? So this is his occlusal scheme. He is a class three with a reverse overjet and a reverse overbite as well. So we dry the teeth and we check his static contacts, tap, tap, tap. And you can see that when he bites together, he's touching the buccal surface of his upper incisors. I check uh, with Shimstock. Uh, when we're tapping, uh, yes. just to, uh, to uh, in the conformative way, we are not guiding the mandible anyway. We are just asking the patient to tap. Ah, yes, no tap dynamic, just a static assessment. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, and because he's class three, you're not going to get any dynamic movement. Of course. So yeah. dynamic is not even a worry for this guy because he will not really slide his teeth. Uh, forward because his mandible is already forward. Yeah. But that's why for this case it's just a static assessment. But what's important here is that we do a shim stock assessment. So you see here, right and left, I've done a shim stock assessment, and we know that the premolars in this situation are holding at eight microns. Mm -hmm. So this means when I do my restoration, everything should be the same afterwards. This is why the pre-assessment is so important. So as you do composites, I rub a dam, composite buttons to, sh to get the right shade for me. So I was just choosing the right composite shade and taking uh, photographs. So now I've built up both sides. This is just simple incisal edge composites there. And then I'm now checking his occlusion and you can see that it's now, it's heavy on my restoration. So I have to adjust and because it's incisal edge, and he's a class three, you know, how we adjust it is important. So you see here, I'm holding the disc against the shape of his teeth to make sure that we replicate the shape. And then this is the restoration after. So just simple incisal edge composites, but what is important here is that it works. So after I've done my composite restorations and adjusted, we check the occlusion again. We've checked it with paper, and now my final check is the shim stock hold, and as you can see here, they are exactly the same as they were before and after. And we've been able to build up his teeth as well. Uh, I'll just touch very briefly on digital. Is that okay with you, Sam, or would you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, it? go ahead. Yeah, and it's uh, something that is um, is is not very well understood. But now we've got. Um, um, Mojo is not, uh, which I know you, you use um, quite a bit now. Um, yes. uh, there's something called, um, it's, a, it's a Russian system, which is more or less like Mojo, called ProSystem. Um, and that has started to appear in the market in, uh, in Egypt uh, only recently, um, uh, which is more or less like Mojo. Okay, so you mean it's like a sensor-based assessment? Yeah. How, yeah. Is it, how is it doing this? It's using, they it's using they do it with sensors, more or less like Modro. They do it with sensors and a camera. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here, one of the most, for me, digital is one of the most significant changes in dentistry, like implants. Uh, always the question is, you know, why do we, why should we go digital? Uh, I think the answer is, why should we not be going digital? Um, it's, it's certainly the future. Just some things that made me decide to go for digital, uh, just, just for your information, really. I won't go through it. Uh, and the advantages are there for, for people to see. I mean, it, it is a steep 
learning curve, but you do save uh, with time as well. And when you do conventional impressions, you know, I think from a patient experience, the digital is far better. Uh, and this is sort of the digital setup that that I have uh, in the practice. We have the, uh, the uh, now the prime scan, uh, milling unit furnace uh, and the cone beam CT scan. And we also have something called module uh, as well. Uh, so scanning, uh, you know, for me is, you know, enjoyable. Uh, it's about data collection. So you see here, I'm just scanning a, a, a case that we were restoring uh, full mouth over time. So this is, I'm just doing the posteriors uh, and just collecting the data from my preparations, making sure is that-, that uh, Is that prime scan? You've got prime? Yeah, that's prime. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a game changer uh, uh, for me. And you can see, you know, in, in, in about, uh, in about uh, an hour, you know, I would have prepped, retraction cords scanned, uh, and then I can put my prototypes on. I don't need to worry about uh, anything else here. And, you know, if I get any errors as well, I can quickly check. And for here, I'm just, just checking that I'm scanning and I've got all the data. But, you know, you, digital doesn't mean that we, we need to be, we, sh we still have shortcuts. We still have to be very precise uh, in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just sort of a situation that the patient presented with. So he had a crown done maybe 10 years ago and it came off, he fractured it. So he, he's come to me now going, I haven't got a crown. I've lost it, it's broken, you know, can you help me? So here, and this is one of the beauties with the uh, scanning and having a milling unit. Pre-assessment, you see here, static assessment, dynamic assessment. So you see here, when he slides dynamically, we have group function. So I have retraction cord, repreparation, we scan, we make a, a restoration. I can even design the occlusion. So this is my restoration being designed and I'm giving contacts on the marginal ridges because I want stability and I want also the palatal cusp to give a contact against the fossa of the lower tooth as well. So we can really design the occlusion very predictably. But digital articulators are present within the system. I don't really use them that much. And this is the case, you know, here where we, we made her, him a milled crown and the occlusion is as it was on the digital scan. You know, I designed it that way and it delivered it that way. So you can see how precise we can design Do you use conventional articulators rather than digital ones? Uh, no, I've, I'm now more and more digital, but I'm more and more without even, I'm not using articulators more than module now. All right. Uh, so we, um, uh, I don't know if you know Florin Kafar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to see him next week. So we're meeting next week and we're going through some, some more aesthetic functional cases really to design aesthetics that are functional no oh, right okay and there you go so some just uh my last slide you know when you have any questions i always say there's no such thing as a silly question uh, uh right because some people uh, have to have these questions yeah we we will i'll turn the video back on if you turn it on just to thank you yes. for oh, your time okay. uh i know it's sunday evening and uh you uh you probably have uh, uh have taken um, a lot of time to um, to, uh, to, um, to to present it, and I thank you very much. Uh, if you just turn your camera on, that would be good. Not wanting you to do it. One second. Yeah, yeah. it's you start the video again. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, uh, I we really I I am. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Riaz. Um, it's uh, it's now <clears throat> quarter to nine on Sunday evening, and uh, he's starting work again. Uh, we're starting work again in the morning. So thank you very very much for that. Uh, and uh, I think we're um, we we've touched on many things now, and uh, some scenarios which are very very important in everyday practice. Uh, it's not about, um, in my view, it's not about understanding the definitions rather than understanding the clinical situations that you face every day. And uh, this simple assessment of occlusion is something that everybody can do in practice using uh, various thick thicknesses of articulating paper and uh, shim stock and making sure that the patients 
um, are assessed properly before you even put a filling. Um, because mm -hmm. then you don't have to keep grinding and grinding and grinding. I don't know how, how long you can grind for. I used to, to do that in the past, but now, um, uh, thanks to people like Riaz um, and others, have, I've, uh, my understanding of occlusion has improved. I'm not perfect, but on the other hand, we only try. Thank you very much, Riaz, and uh, have a yeah, nice evening. Sure. And uh, we'll meet again uh, when, we, uh, when we discuss TMJ um, uh, in another webinar. Thank you, Riaz. Jazakallah khair, and uh, have a nice well, evening. Well, uh, well, Assalamu alaikum. You can uh, now, uh, we'll well, end the meeting now. All right. I'm just going to stop the recording.